Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started in about two minutes just to give folks the opportunity to log on. Thanks. All right, everyone, we are going to get started. Um, my name is Muffy Grant. I'm the executive director of the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation. And I would just like to welcome you all um, for, for joining us today on what may prove to be a very blustery, windy, rainy um, Thursday here in North Carolina. So we're hoping to get through this very rich uh, agenda um, in time before there's the potential for losing power, but maybe not, hopefully not. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. I'd like to invite you all to use the chat um, in order to talk with one another during the presentation and panel. There's going to be a lot of great information and a really superstar phenomenal panel. Um, so we'll try our best to mostly answer the questions in the chat, but a lot of um, the questions that you ask in the beginning in particular may be restricted to time because we really do want to make sure we reserve uh, a good chunk of time for our panel. Um, this webinar will be recorded. We will send out the recording along with the slides shortly after this webinar, either today or tomorrow. So I just want to thank you and, and sort of seed the conversation as it relates to North Carolina. Um, the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation was um, given funding to commission um, a panel to parents during the fall of this past year. And it really aimed to ask two questions. What were the issues with um, finding childcare and the cost um, burden on families pre-pandemic? And then what are families feeling mid-pandemic? have their attitudes towards um, the type of childcare that they're seeking changed? Um, have they lost childcare in their community because uh, providers could no longer stay in business? Have they been um, really leaning into family, friend and neighbor care and other informal types of care situations? Um, and so through that, we also were able to get an economic an economic analysis um, commissioned through um, an economist at um, City University of New York. Um, and he's also the chief economist at Teachers College at Columbia University. And what the survey showed us, um, the first thing about it, which was really great, was it was a relatively um, representative sample of 802 working North Carolinian parents with young children, zero to five in NC. Um, the participant characteristics from late October correspond very closely to our demographics here in North Carolina, um, representing urban, suburban, and rural populations. Um, and also it aligns with the state's racial demographics. So next slide, some key takeaways. Um, there we go. Some key takeaways were that um, pre-pandemic, only half of all parents were able to access any type of formal center-based care. 
six months into the pandemic, which was October, the time that the survey was conducted, um, this rate fell to less than one in three. The decline in enrollment was caused by families exiting the former sector completely. The formal sector, excuse me. Only half of all working parents receive any type of childcare supports from their employers, and most of the available supports were opportunities for leave from work. Fewer than one in 10 receive subsidized childcare from their employer. Emphatically, these parents say that childcare is too expensive or too low quality. Also, many childcare arrangements are not worker friendly, convenient, or flexible. Um, the pandemic has just made childcare unaffordable for many families. Many other parents are not working and no longer need childcare. As the pandemic continues, parent ex parents expect these trends to worsen. Households of color face more early education challenges. Uh, the care that they rely on is lower quality with fewer employer supports, and the pandemic has disproportionately impaired their access to childcare. Rural families have much lower access to early care and education than families in cities and suburbs. Next slide. So what does that mean for North Carolina? Um, you know, in our economy writ large, each year more than 400,000 North Carolina parents struggle to find childcare. This is infrastructure um, that empowers parents to work, build family stability and support and a strong state economy for all of us. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic is making this already acceptable, unacceptable number even worse. The struggle to find childcare meant that North Carolina families, businesses, taxpayers, and our entire state economy were losing nearly $2.4 billion per year, and this is before the pandemic. At this point in time, that number stands at $2.9 billion um, and is likely still growing. Formal childcare availability has fallen by approximately half since the pandemic. Both supply and demand factors are playing an important role in the new mid-pandemic patterns of childcare. Some families have lost childcare because their, employer, their provider has closed, others because they couldn't find a provider during the pandemic. Significantly, three in 10 families no longer rely on childcare because they simply can't afford it. And one third are not working and therefore have substituted in-home care over formal center-based care. It still remains to be determined if this last group of parents will be able to find work again if they have no obvious access to childcare. Families need early child care, um, early child early childhood care and education to help them be productive. When the education is inadequate, workers are disadvantaged in terms of time spent at work, work productivity and effort, and career opportunities, opportunities for advancement. These adversities were present before the pandemic and they have certainly intensified during the pandemic. And I'm sure many of you all probably can relate to that if you have young children at this, at this time. The double bind, um, access and affordability. North Carolina parents need adequate and affordable childcare in order to fully participate in the labor market. There is now substantial evidence that childcare options affect time at work, productivity when working, and career opportunities. The impacts are various, long, and economically significant. In turn, businesses are affected, and so are tax revenues across the state. These relationships were evident before the pandemic, but the pandemic has intensified them. Working parents are in a double bind. They cannot find jobs because they cannot access childcare. And without jobs, they cannot build the skills and experience that will allow them to afford high quality childcare. At the same time, the rising cost of provide, providing COVID safe childcare, parents are further pushed out of the formal childcare market. These patterns are especially salient for females of color with children. Statewide, many parents are unable to access childcare that meets the demands of their jobs. These parents had access to affordable, high quality and flexible childcare. Our entire economy here in the state of North Carolina um, would be much stronger. So at this point in time, um, 
it's my great honor to introduce to you the communications director of the first five years fund, um, Charlie Jockin, who's going to share a little bit with us about how um, early childhood investments across the country and in particular in eight swing, swing, stakes, swing states are very um, popular across the political spectrum. Um, so without further ado, Charlie, uh, welcome to North Carolina and we look forward to learning from you. Thank you very much, Muffy, and um, to the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation. Um, I recognize, like, like you mentioned, that a lot of folks are experiencing bad weather, so hoping for safety and a, a quick passage of this storm. Um, as Muffy mentioned, I work uh, with an organization called the First Five Years Fund, which is a federal-facing advocacy organization working to ensure that all kids um, have equitable access to high quality early learning and care opportunities, um, particularly kids um, living in poverty who we know uh, would benefit most from, from these opportunities and from these programs. Um, and as part of our work, we uh, often poll voters nationally as part of an advocacy tool to show lawmakers that there is widespread support um, among voters of all walks of life across all political persuasions for the kind of programs and systems and investments that we know stand to really benefit kids and families, communities, and, and the broader economy. So um, depending on whether we're in an election year or what's happening on Capitol Hill or what's happening broadly politically in America, we, um, we conduct these polls and um, periodically like we did in September of this past year, we did an oversample of our poll um, in swing states that are especially important electorally. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, the states where we did an oversample in September were Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Iowa, Maine, Michigan, and North Carolina. And so what you'll see throughout um, this deck is that we, we have data that shows the sentiments of voters nationally and um, the sentiments of voters in these um, swing states. It doesn't necessarily represent the views of, let's say, North Carolina voters. It is sort of the aggregate of voters in these swing states, but it's still particularly compelling when you're thinking about um, speaking to lawmakers and to campaigns um, about these issues because it shows that you know there's an understanding in um, in some of these states that matter most particularly in 2020 through a presidential election um, that these are issues that candidates and elected officials um, should really be paying attention to um, so the next slide and maybe even one after that um, just to sort of start off and as part of an establishing um, set of questions, we wanted to gauge how um, families who were being, uh, who participated in this um, survey, so parents, how they were gauging um, and, and feeling the impact of the pandemic for themselves and for their families. Um, so we asked a handful of questions you know, uh, about the pandemic in general and maybe not specific to childcare and early learning. Um, obviously, you know, bear in mind that this is from September, so a few months ago and things change really, really rapidly. And so maybe sentiments um, in September were maybe a little bit different than right now, probably not too terribly different given that the pandemic and its impact are still felt really, really strongly in, among families across the country. Um, but at the you know the other piece of that is that in September Congress had not yet passed either the relief package that that Congress passed in December or the American Rescue Plan um, that just passed um, a couple weeks ago. But the data is still very very relevant, um, and I think as you'll see later on, it really does help paint a picture um, of the the perception of childcare and early learning and, and its importance, both in the middle of the pandemic, but also broadly a, a change in perception about these important issues. So as you'll see here, um, there's no question that voters nationally and voters in swing states say that the pandemic has had a, a tremendous impact um, on both work and family situations. And you can um, see that there is sort of an intensity scale there where people are saying there is a lot or 
either some or a lot of an impact, both among um, all voters and swing state voters. Next slide. Um, and we asked uh, the parents who were participating in the survey whether they thought that their current childcare situation um, was something that would work for them uh, in the long term, something that was working for them now or not working for them at all. And it's pretty remarkable that almost 50% of parents, 46% um, said that their um, current childcare situation would only work for them in the short term or not working for them at all. And I think that um, obviously this pertains to, to families with older school age kids too, but there's no question that that, that is indicative of what, um, what families with, with younger kids from birth through age five were, were feeling. Um, and uh, we also know just from, from other surveys that have um, been taken that the, the impact as um, Muffy was just mentioning of some of the closures that childcare facilities were experiencing have, have had a true and um, hopefully not lasting, but a strong impact on families. Um, and then the next slide I think is perhaps the most consequential from um, this poll. Uh, we asked voters whether um, they think that the, the pandemic has revealed how essential childcare is and overwhelmingly voters um, say that the pandemic has shown how essential it is that we build up a childcare system um, that works for all families who need it. 80% of all voters, um, I don't think it's a surprise that even more women say it is essential um, that we build up a strong childcare system in America. And Republican women who in any election um, are, are more falling into that swing category electorally, 63% uh, of Republican women agree. Um, that the pandemic has revealed how essential it is um, that we build up a strong child care system in America. So really, really consequential and something that we as advocates know we have to leverage because people's memories are short. And so we, we want to make sure we're taking advantage of this moment where there is such a deep understanding about the importance of, of child care and early learning. Um, so then uh, we moved on to begin asking more child care and early learning specific questions. And on the next slide, um, you'll see that we wanted to gauge how voters um, feel about what Congress should be doing in terms of, um, of priorities. And you'll see that we asked about things like, should, should Congress be doing more to help small businesses or healthcare workers? large employers, and then we tested working parents of young children and child care providers. And the support for Congress doing more to help both working parents and child care providers was incredibly strong. Um, and you'll see to the far right that number remains high, while not quite as high as the, the vote or the uh, support nationally, still really, really high among swing state voters. Um, virtually no one thinks that we should be doing less to support these people in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see um, that when we are focusing specifically on um, Congress doing more for working parents with young children, when we look at sort of a demographic breakdown of, um, of these groups, suburban women, independent voters and moms, the, the support is particularly high I think there's a, a deep understanding of the challenges that um, that parents, particularly moms, are facing through this pandemic. And so support for Congress to do more to help um, working parents is, is incredibly high. And the same on the next slide is true um, with that understanding that we talked about um, related to childcare, support for ensuring um, support for Congress doing more to support childcare providers through the pandemic. Um, is also immensely high among all of these important voter groups um, that, that we know are often key to deciding um, elections. So incredibly persuasive when you're talking to, to lawmakers and candidates about how, um, how they should be focusing their attention through relief efforts. Um, the next slide gets into um, a question that we ask year after year, and that is, um, should 
uh, funding for the federal early learning and care programs, um, including child care and preschool, should it be increased, decreased, or kept the same? And overwhelmingly, there is um, support year after year for increasing um, federal funding for early learning and care programs. When you think about things like Head Start and the Child Care and Development Block Grant, um, these are programs that we know have such a major impact on families, but also on states and their ability to, um, to implement programs that are so important for kids and families. Um, and so well over half of voters uh, say that they um, think that funding for these programs at the federal level should be um, increased. And when you go to the next slide, you can see that when we break this down and look at the, the cross tabs across some of these um, different demographic groups, the, the support remains high among swing state voters, um, independents and moderates. And then when you look at voters who are younger, 44, 44 years and younger, Latino voters, moms and suburban women, that level of support goes up even higher um, than where you see it for, for voters nationally. Um, and that is incredibly important um, you know, in, in our advocacy. But what's often surprising to people is that when you break it down um, and look at uh, voters who are parents versus voters who are not parents, um, Non-parents tend to have higher levels of support for these sorts of investments. There are a million different theories um, and anecdotal reasons why that might be. We've done some focus groups to test some of these concepts and theories. And um, while there's not really definitive proof, anecdotally, we often hear that parents believe this is something that I have to do on my own. It is my responsibility to um, supply, you know, and provide for the care and education of, of my kids before they get to kindergarten. So the government is, is not responsible. And yet people who are not parents in the moment recognize that maybe even maybe a little bit more than parents, that there is perhaps um, a need to be doing more to support kids and families. And so, um, Support is still in the majority um, for parents and non-parents, but it's always interesting that, um, that the support is, is higher among non-parents. All right, on the next slide, um, we transition into um, the need for both uh, an investment in, in relief uh, as it relates to the pandemic, but also thinking a little bit more about um, you know, the long-term investments that we know that we need. And so on the next slide, you'll see, um, thinking about America's recovery from this pandemic um, and, and what is needed to get the economy going, uh, two thirds of voters say that high quality affordable childcare is at least very important. So if you're thinking about whether it's somewhat important, very important or essential, two thirds say that it's at least very important, but almost a full third of voters say without question that childcare is essential to getting the economy going, which you know, is, is remarkable um, and, and something we know that lawmakers understand um, as well. And then on the next slide, that, um, that support exists among Republicans, independents, and Democrats. We're, we're in the majority um, at 54% of Republicans, independents at 63%, 81% of Democrats all agree that childcare is essential to getting, um, to getting our economy going as we think about a recovery from the pandemic. Um, on the next slide, um, I mentioned earlier just the, the general understanding about um, what the, the pandemic has re revealed about childcare. This to me, this first bullet on this slide is the most, um, I would say consequential for, or at least striking from what we found as part of this poll that voters now say that childcare is an essential service just like healthcare and education, which is remarkable. There's no question that voters have always thought about, you know, quote unquote education for, K-12, things like that, and healthcare um, as being essential services um, that 
that will strengthen the workforce um, and that we need to be doing more to, to build it up. But now we know that 84% of voters nationally say that childcare is an essential service, just like health care and education. And 55% say that they strongly agree. Um, so that's that's really, really remarkable and something I think that um, you know, is a result of the pandemic and the devastation that we've seen to the childcare and early learning sector and the impact that that has um, that it has had on families nationwide. Again, thinking about things in the long term, having more high quality child care will strengthen the US economy and the workforce over the long term. Really, really strong numbers there. And then um, going back to that um, point that we made before, 53% strongly say that the child care, that the coronavirus crisis has shown us how essential it is that we build up a system of care that makes child care available and affordable to all families who need it. Um, the next slide, um, thinking about you know, the impact of the pandemic and um, you know, all of the data showing that closures of childcare and early learning facilities are gonna have a, a major impact on parents' ability to return to the workplace whenever the time is right. Voters say that they're worried that, um, that these childcare facilities are going to close or stay closed. Um, and that is an intensity level of 58%. Of so of, of all of, all voters nationally, 58% say they are worried about it, and well over a quarter um, say they're worried a great deal about it, which is a, a really, really strong intensity. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see um, that when you think about all of the uh, potential outcomes of families, communities, children losing out on that access to, to quality childcare, the number one concern that people have um, is that it will have a negative impact on kids and their learning um, and the skills that we know children are developing during these, these earliest, most consequential years of their education and development. The, the second one being you know, the, the family economic side of things, parents not being able to return to the workplace. Um, and then um, third, pretty close behind that, that um, parents being able to return to work is the, the financial stress and uncertainty that families are facing. Um, other concerns that still rank high, but it is um, pretty compelling that the number one concern um, that, that voters say they had about um, the, the challenges with childcare through the pandemic are about kids not being able to um, get the strong start academically that we know that they would um, otherwise get. So um, after this slide, every year we test a um, theoretical, but largely mirroring a real uh, proposal that is ex that exists in Congress that says Congress would provide funding to states to expand their existing child care programs so that every working parent who wants to could affordably send their child to high quality child care, early learning or pre-kindergarten program of their choice. Um, and then the amount that parents would pay would be based on their income with the lowest income families paying low or no cost. Overwhelming support um, for a proposal like this, which just shows that um, you know, voters believe that, that Congress should um, be investing in a, a strong child care system that ensures that all families who need it have access to, to high quality early learning and care opportunities. And when you look at the demographic breakdown on the next slide, that support exists among every um, demographic group, Republicans, independents, and Democrats. When you think about those key voter groups of Republican and suburban women, when you think about moms, parents, and um, non-parents, the support is high across the board for, for this sort of a proposal, which is incredibly helpful um, when, when my colleagues are, are on the Hill talking to lawmakers. And then the last um, concept that, or second to last concept that we um, always test with voters is whether they say they would have more, they would support their members of Congress more if he or she supported a greater investment in early learning. Um, and this is helpful when we're talking to lawmakers because it shows that um, 
you know, when they do support these sorts of things that they're gonna have a lot of support from their voters. But what it also shows that's particularly helpful is that there's no downside to it. No one is gonna oppose them for supporting things, these things. So maybe um, it is helpful to, to show that there, there is support for them um, acting on, on these issues, but there's also no downside whatsoever among uh, voters who might otherwise be critical of, of other things that, that they wanna act on. Um, and then this one to me is always really, really persuasive. Um, this idea, you know, that there's just a general understanding that when a child turns five, they will have access to education uh, that is publicly funded through kindergarten. But before they tur turn five, that's not necessarily guaranteed. And our poll shows that 77% of Americans, including 61% of Republicans, believe that the care and education of kids from birth through age five should um, should be publicly funded in the same way that it is starting in kindergarten. So really, really compelling um, in terms of the voting public's understanding about the importance of uh, the care and education of kids uh, beginning at birth. That is excellent, Charlie. Thank you so much. It. You did a great job. And I know I took up more time than I was supposed to. So <laughs> we'll have you back in North Carolina yeah, any old right. time so you want to come. I got a lot to say. <laughs> so let me know whenever you can have me back. Well, thank you. We're going to move on to our panel now, and it's my honor to introduce to you um, the moderator of our panel, yeah, Shonda Sumter. Um, Shonda sorry is that. the, um, right. sorry, I've had this up here. She's with our friends and partners um, at NC Child, and I'm looking for your proper title, Shonda. I can't believe that I'm messing this up because I wanted to be, you are the early childhood education campaign manager at NC Child um, and also the owner of two child care centers. Um, so she, I'm going to turn it over to her so that she can moderate the superstar panel. Apology, Shonda, I owe you some chocolate you cookies. You're fine. You're absolutely fine. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so happy to be here. And um, thank you so much, Charlie, for all of that information. Like, great data and I definitely would love to hear more um, from you. Um, but today I want to go ahead and get started with our three phenomenal panelists that we have here with us. I want to introduce um, them to you all. I have um, Cassandra Brooks and she's the owner and operator of Little Believers Academy. And then we have Chanel Croxton, known as CC. She is um, the North Carolina Organizing Director um, for the National Domestic Workers Alliance. And then Dr. Devanya Govenhunt. She's the president of the Black Child Development Institute in Charlotte. Welcome, ladies. Um, I'm going to go ahead and dive right in so we can begin having conversation around the topic at hand, which is a very hot topic um, since, you know, COVID has hit. So my first question is for you, Devanya. Um, we know the inequities in the child, um, in the child care field struggles are not new at all. Um, and they existed pre-pandemic. As someone connected deeply to the Black community in Charlotte and advocating on behalf of Black children and families, help us to understand the history of how these inequities came to be. Why are Black and Brown families being hit harder by this pandemic and the child care crisis? Awesome, thank you, Shonda. And thanks for um, the invitation to actually participate. So we don't have weeks and weeks for this particular conversation right now in this moment, right? So we're gonna to have to abbreviate as much as we can because that is a loaded question. Like it's a loaded question. Um, and what I like to share with people is that COVID did not, is not responsible for all of this. All of these inequities, all of the disparities, COVID is not responsible for 100% uh, of the struggles that our black community is facing right now. Black folks have been um, dealing with essentially two pandemics, right? There's racism and then there's COVID-19, right, on top of that. So decades of occupational and residential segregation um, has been an issue for decades, decades. 
uh, which means that our Black families have are more likely to have less access to telework and the flexibility that it affords them to be able to take care of the young children that they have. If they cannot go to work because of the lack of child care, then that, 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 make, that puts them in a position where they have to choose between going to work to pay their bills, right, and pay child care, or stay home to take care of their children and risk not being able to feed them. Nobody should ever have to make those decisions. No one should ever have to make those decisions. Um, so many of our, our families have worked, have reported being having to work through this pandemic. Um, because a lot of them are essential workers. They're on the front lines and they don't have the affordability of being able to work from home. So they've worked through the pandemic and they've had to resort to um, relying closely on fam family, friends and neighbor care because there is, um, you know, so many of our childcare centers that have had to close their doors or just have not been able to be able to, to uh, find the support that they need in order to keep their doors open and be safe at the same time. Um, so yeah, we got it. We're dealing with the system, and we have to be comfortable calling it what it is, right? Uh, a lot of people are uncomfortable doing that, but we have to call it what it is. We're dealing with a system that has been designed and built on top of racial inequalities, racial segregation, um, and that's a problem. A problem. The the bright side of this situation, uh, Shonda, is that we have the opportunity to rebuild better, to come out on top of this thing and to make this make some changes to the system so that all of our children, all of our families have what they need in order to, in order to thrive um, in, this, in, in, this, in this world, really. Yes, I, I have to totally agree with you, um, Devanya. And the results from um, the, the, day, the data of the day that uh, Charlie presented to us shows us that the majority of Americans feel the same way. So, um, Cece, I have a question for you. As an advocate for domestic workers, including um, child care teachers, um, we know that um, child care teachers, both in the formal and informal sectors, are bearing a lot of the brunt of this pandemic. What inequities in how child care teachers are treated by our systems were exacerbated by the pandemic? Yes, um, thanks Shonda for that introduction and the question. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to the NC Early Childhood Foundation for being part of this event and to be, you know, sharing space with these brilliant voices that I'm alongside. So very honored to be here today. Um, and I want to start to address that question by talking about the work that we do as the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the bases that we represent. So for folks who are unfamiliar, we are a membership-based organization that was founded in 2007 and we represent the millions of domestic workers and care workers across the country who are mostly black women, women of color, US born and immigrant born as well, um, who provide care for our loved ones in our homes. And that includes childcare providers across the spectrum. Um, and so to answer the question and to start off with, I want to look at the early education sector in three parts. So looking at the formal side, which includes the licensed childcare, um, which includes child care providers in centers as well as family child care homes and those in the informal sector, um, workers known as nannies or those who are hired directly by the families that they work for. Um, so pre-pandemic, child care providers face a number of obstacles, as you pointed out, a number of inequities for teachers and professionals in centers. This looked like dealing with low wages um, of about 11 to $12 an hour, almost 40% of the workforce on some form of public assistance and truly a lack of comprehensive or limited life-affirming benefits, what I call life-affirming benefits that includes paid time off, paid leave, retirement benefits, and health insurance. For family child care home owners, uh, they also face some of the same challenges, including low wages at an even lower rate of a median wage of about $9 an hour. They also have to grapple with low subsidy rates if they have children who are on subsidy in their program. Um, that truly does not keep up with the cost of care and what it takes to provide quality to those children. And they also have to maintain quality for their students while being both a provider and an owner without the help of an additional teacher. Um, also have to struggle with securing health care with only 16% um, completely uninsured or 21% receiving health care through their spouse. 
And lastly, also having to navigate the complex regulations that can sometimes create an additional burden on them um, as they provide the necessary care to their children. For nannies and providers who are in the informal sector who are providing that care in the home, also low wages at $11 an hour, and a unique history of having to deal with a history of exclusion um, for domestic workers that includes carve outs from protection such as overtime pay for nannies who, who give live-in work. Um, also exclusions from minimum protections like employment discrimination or harassment. And on top of that, also facing the precarious nature of the work and the varying standards that comes with whatever agreements or contracts that they're able to negotiate directly with their families. And so you see some of the shared issues and also some unique ones to each of those parts of the sector. Now, understanding all of this, the child care system has been defined by low standards for the workforce and has been tremendously impacted by the pandemic over the past year that it's raged on. It's presented a health crisis um, for the system by having a lack of safeguards for a public health crisis of this nature, including a lack of health and safety protocols to keep children and teachers safe on the job, as well as a lack of adequate paid leave that I spoke to for workers to care for themselves or their family members in case of emergency. Economically, the pandemic has also done a number on workers. So for a workforce that already experiences a poverty rate that is 7.4 times as high as K-8 teachers and a poverty rate of 17.6%, this pandemic was a economic crisis that they truly just could not afford. Um, and having to deal with uh, closures of their centers in the beginning or being furloughed or being laid off um, is something that has exasperated the already precarious economic nature of the work. Um, and so in just in response to the question, you know, the pandemic has really laid bare these conditions that child care professionals have to deal with on a regular basis when they commit to the profession. And so while there was initial closings, child care workers have been showing up every day in centers and in the homes, supporting our economy and caring for our children and letting us go into the world to do what we need to do. Um, and what has happened has shown us that we truly can't function without child care providers. And yet our system and our and the conditions that they face show us that even though they're labeled essential, um, they truly are expendable. Um, and in regards to their counterparts in the K through 12, they're not seen as professional and they don't have the same investment. And so the pandemic has really destabilized this already struggling system that never had the support from the state in the first place. And in order for us to truly recover and get on the other side of this pandemic and to truly transform the childcare system, you know, we have to make that connection that all of us are connected to childcare, all of us are impacted by it. And it's in the interest of all of us to work together to fix our system. Exactly. Thank you so much for that, CC. Um, Cassandra, mm -hmm. you've been sitting in a unique position during this pandemic as a child care center owner and operator. Um, you are in the crosshairs of what families need, what providers need, and what the ECE teachers need. Mm -hmm. What are some of the struggles that each of those groups are dealing with during this crisis? Thank you so much, Shonda, and thank you again um, for having me on this panel. I'm just very delighted and always humbled to be able to share um, share my experiences um, with everyone. But um, like you said, I sit in um, child care owner director, and I see it from so many different angles. I see it from the teacher side, the parents and family side, um, the ch you know the children, the different things they face. My other provider, um, if you will colleagues, friends, um, just over over this course, it was already, um, like Dr. Hunt said, it has already uh, been very shaky on shaky grounds, but this is just another layer on top of um, on top of everything. So from a provider perspective, um, I started along with um, many other providers and during this pandemic, um, ladies that are very strong, um, have masters in education, et cetera, have ran five-star quality programs just like myself. Unfortunately, they had to close. Um, and so it, it really um, 
you know, really makes me sad that, you know, people that are, that we need in this field, that we need to help these children, help these families, they couldn't go on. They had to close their doors. Um, and some of my other ones, they've had to scale back. You know, they, they are, you know, really op operating very minimally because they can't afford it. They can't afford to bring in the staffing due to all of the extra precautions that we have to take, due to all of the um, extra steps that we have to take to keep everyone safe, due to the lower ratios, trying to keep all of the children safe. They just can't do it. Um, so then I see it from my parents' perspective and my children, and my heart always goes out um you know to the children and things that they suffer you know I have a family now living in a hotel you know trying to work with them and their social worker to try to get them enough funding to be able to move out of the hotel I mean this is this is just not like one off this has been happening um like you know Dr. Hunt said these families have already been on this system uh, for quite some time and the racism that has occurred they just cannot get off of the system some of them and you know they're living in hotels, homeless, um, living in shelters, um, food insecurities. You know, uh, myself, I've purchased diapers. My mom has purchased diapers. And, you know, anybody that can help these families and children, that's what we've had to do. Um, quite recently, as a result of the pandemic, I'm working with a uh, mother now. Um, this is a mother with a four-year degree. She has two sets of twins, beautiful babies, beautiful babies. Uh, one set is identical, seven months old. And the other set is, I believe, uh, 16 to 18 months. And so she's looking for childcare, but she can't find childcare that can accept all four of her children. So I'm trying to, you know, find uh, if she can come to this center and that center. And, you know, even though that's a struggle, that's another added struggle for a mom. Um, I don't know if you, you know, been a mom of young children, but that is difficult already to try to go to work, pick them up on time, all of those things. And then you have to go to two different stops. Can you imagine, you know, so that that is a result of the lack of teacher wages, um, teachers leaving the field. Um, and, and quite honestly, you know, I, I can't blame them in certain senses when they can go to Amazon and other places and make $15 an hour with benefits at other places, even McDonald's pays more. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but we require the education um, because it is needed. Studies have shown that education directly impacts young children. And so I see the struggles that my teachers have faced during this time, the struggles even before that, they didn't have health insurance. I lost two teachers as a result of not having adequate health insurance. That hurts when you have someone on your team that you lose, that you directly work with each and every day that impacts children and families and, and they lost a battle that shouldn't have been lost. Mm -hmm. So then we couple a pandemic on top of that. So then I have teachers that get COVID, young children that get COVID, and they don't have health insurance to teachers. They can't get treated. So they're just, you know, trying to weigh it out. You know, their whole family gets it. You know, these, these are some of the things that they are facing each and every day. I have teachers on food stamps, welfare, if you will. They are just struggling just to have gas money to be able to come to work making $10 an hour, $12 an hour. And these are people with high education, just like our public school counterparts. We're just educating children at a very young age. They're educating a, a little bit older, but it's still we're educating children at a very young age. And their education is really no difference. I have people on my staff right now with master's in education. I've had people with a doctorate in education, you know, but they still should get paid accordingly for the service that they provide and the education that they provide. So I, I am in a unique position. Um, you know, you're trying to figure out what is, you know, what is the best way, what is going to help everybody. I have a lot of sleepless nights <laughs> trying to figure this thing out and, you know, just, just not quite there yet, but we're going to get there. Yes, Cassandra, I have to say, I feel <laughs> what you're saying, especially when you talk about mother twins. I have twins myself, and I know that's double work. So to have to go to two, make two stops, that's just, nobody should have to do that. That's that's just not, that's just unacceptable. Um, um, Dr. Hunt, how does family, friend, and neighbor care, and I'm talking about both informal care and mm -hmm. family child care home fit into this conversation? Absolutely. Um, so it's the simple way to put it, uh, Shonda, is that we have to support it. We have got to support it. 
the way that our system looks at, refers to, categorizes, and talks about friends, family, and neighbor care is a little bit disturbing. Well, it's a mm -hmm. lot disturbing, actually. Uh, parents of very young children across, across all income levels, cultural groups, across languages, across communities, want caregivers who know and value their children and who share fundamental family customs and values and taking care of their children. And so there should not be a downside for relying on friends, family, and neighbor care. Uh, many families that we work with here on the ground have reported resorting to friends, family, and neighbor care during this pandemic because they've lost formal child care, so to speak. Their centers had to close their doors, their providers had to close down because of a lack of support. Um, but, but families want programs that are culturally relevant, that are culturally responsive, that are affirming, that are rich. Um, and that's where they want their babies. That's where they want their fam where they want their children. Um, and so DCD actually reported, DCDEE in uh, North Carolina reported an uptick, right? Over the past year in family childcare homes opening, which actually proves the point that family childcare providers have been stepping in and filling the gaps for families. They've been stepping in and filling the gaps for families. That is important. That is something that we need to acknowledge and pay very close attention to. Because obviously, um, the people that we work with on the ground, the people that we hear from, the people who are suffering from these disparities, these inequities, the people who have lost their child care programs, um, actually express how fortunate they have been to find a family child care provider with an intimate setting, with someone who actually cares and understands the customs and the values that they come, that children cross that threshold with. So it's important. It is important. We have got to find a way to change the language that we've been using when we refer to friends, family, and neighbor care, yes. because it matters. It yes. matters. Absolutely. We've just got to, we've got to support them. And there's super, there are lots of opportunities out there to work with um, these folks. And they think that, you know, I heard somebody say a couple of weeks ago that because um, their child was not, was with grandma or with auntie during the day that there was not learning going on. And that's not the case. That is not the case. So this is a this is a kind of deficit language that I'm talking about that we hear out in the community. And there are all sorts of resources and um, techniques that we can support family, friends, and neighbor care with because they're in the process of building brains as well. Just because they're not in a large child care building, just because they're not in a K through 12 building does not mean that they are not growing brains. Exactly. And this is where families are comfortable. And if we truly are talking about redesigning systems and meeting people where they are and building things with families and not for families, we have got to take into consideration that this is happening. It's a reality. It's proven to be good for so many of our children. And we've got to find a way to support that as well. Exactly. I can't agree with you more. Actually, the early years of zero to five is the most important in, for a child's brain development. So that those are the most important years. And we, we need to, to definitely, you know, have this much needed conversation. Cece, the problems in the childcare sector aren't new. And what we always hear is, is that they're difficult to fix, that the solutions have to be um, long-term in scope and that teachers need to be patient and the situation will slowly improve. Did the response to the pandemic shed any light on this idea that change is difficult and must be slow? Absolutely. I think the response absolutely shed light on what is possible and what is possible now and for the long term. And I want to point out, you know, the official response to the pandemic is really a contradiction within itself. You have, on one hand, a really slow response to the health crisis that has resulted in more than half a million deaths. And on the other hand, a small set of really impactful, effective measures that have that, that the government has offered up to truly stem the economic crisis on hand. And so while I'm of the belief that our government has generally failed us, you know, there are a couple of things that I want to point to, both on the federal and local level that have addressed some of the deep-seated issues in the child care field, some of the ones that I spoke to earlier. 
So on the federal level, one of the things we saw was in the CARES Act, an expansion of unemployment programs that truly assisted childcare workers during this time when it was needed the most. It not only aided workers in the childcare field who struggled with the loss of hours and income, but it also included many of the childcare providers who otherwise wouldn't be considered for unemployment. Um, and so just a little bit of context for that, NC ranks among the lowest states in terms of unemployment when it comes to maximum benefit amount, when it comes to duration of the benefits and the percentage of jobless folks who are able to receive those benefits. And the federal changes that came in these packages really changed the conditions that um, folks find in unemployment and allowed for those benefits to help workers to gain more for longer periods of time. It allowed for them to cover more types of workers, including self-employed workers. So folks like family child care providers and nannies now were able to, to access unemployment insurance, which helped them throughout this time to deal with loss in enrollment, loss of income, and loss of hours. We also saw things like paid sick and emergency family leave that were provided in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that extended necessary benefits to workers for comprehensive paid time off related to the virus. And so many child care providers, it allowed for them to access finally adequate leave to care for themselves if they got sick with the virus or if they had to care for their children due to the virus or to school closures. And this is paid leave that under normal ordinary circumstances, they just wouldn't have. And so you saw you know, the contrast between pre-pandemic and what was offered up um, in regards to these types of benefits. Locally, we saw an even more aggressive uh, public response and investment in our childcare system. Um, and I wanna point to a couple of things that the Division of Child Development and Early Education has done throughout this year to really step up for childcare workers. Um, and so you saw different policies enacted to address the crisis, like the waiving of parent co-pay fee, co fees for, for families, paying in full for subsidized slots for um, enrollments when they dropped, funding of emergency child care for first responders and essential workers um, who are on the front lines of the crisis, relaxing of regulations, providing bonus payments, um, and not just one-time bonus payments, but bonus payments throughout many months of the crisis, operational grants to centers and family child care homes, health and sanitation supplies, PPE, and a lot more. And so the response was really comprehensive and allowed for the crisis not to get to a point of no return. And so one of the stories that I think points to, you know, this stark contrast is one that I had a story I had with one of our members in NDWA who spoke to me about the money that she was making throughout this time. So she she pointed to being on unemployment when she was furloughed, um, and then also the money that she was making through bonus payments throughout the pandemic, and pointed to that as the most that she's ever made in this field in decades of doing this work. And so I think that you know that story alone points to the problems at hand, the problems that exist and are deeply rooted in our early childhood system and shows just how divested our system has been. And so all in all, I think that, you know, it points to, you know, in regards to change and transformation and how long that takes, that this was always possible. And what it comes down to is political will and the courage and opportunity. Um, and in moments of crisis, what I've seen as, you know, an organizer, um, crisis really creates polarization and an urgency to respond in different ways. And this moment in the pandemic was no different. And so the changes that we need to make to our early childhood system are many and they're costly, but they can be moved now. And it really rests on our ability as a public to demand that change. Um, I wanna point to a couple of weeks ago when we saw our legislators really committed to maintaining the status quo in the passage of uh, House Bill 196, when um, in determining how the federal uh, federal relief money for childcare was to be divided and appropriated, uh, they passed a provision that said that none of that money, you know, the the hundreds of millions of dollars coming into the state, could be used for bonus payments in a time where providers really need it the most. And so, in a moment to do right by workers, they chose to do the opposite and maintain, you know, that consistent, you know, kind of conservative fiscal approach. Um, and it was a slap in the face of workers who have shown up over a year 
doing this work to hold our economy together. Um, and they are the ones that are telling us to be patient and wait and that change will happen. And we know if it left up to them, nothing is going to change. And so I always point to, you know, our counterparts in the K through 12 system who, you know, just our continuation of, of, of the teaching system um, and their moment in 2018 when they revitalized their own movement, when they had a walkout, when they had, uh, you know, a public outcry for, you know, K through 12 teachers to raise standards for their work um, and for the folks who are in the K through 12 public education system. Um, and I want to see the same thing for early childhood educators. I think it's past time. I think we deserve it. And that if it is to happen, if we are to truly have the transformation of our early childhood system, you know, it's going to take for us to make that public demand and that outcry um, and for us to work from, you know, from the top to bottom to, to transform the system through our collective action, through our collective work and through really forcing the hands of the folks who are making these decisions, because if it left up to them, as I said, nothing is going to happen, but it truly is in our hand and we have the opportunity to do that and we need to take it. PC, that was awesome. You, you summed it all up together. We are hitting time, but I just want to say this. In North Carolina, we are beginning to have stakeholder conversations and you three ladies are part of those conversations surrounding long-term long campaign to transform the early care and education system, right? And we're not just talking about licensed childcare because it's the whole system. So we're beginning to have these conversations about this long-term initiative. And I'm just happy to be able to work with you ladies. Um, thank you so much for your time here today. Thank you so much for all of your knowledge and expertise and being so willing to share it with us today. I'm gonna turn it back this over to you, Muffy. This was so excellent. I mean, this panel, I could listen to you all on a loop all day, every day. Um, you just really, really underscore where we need to prioritize and that we can't live in this moment and live in scarcity and that there's not enough. It's just, what is our priority? Where are our priorities? Um, there was one question and I thought, Cassandra, you might be able to answer this. I know the answer is yes, but I can't remember the time frame. Was there bonus pay for childcare workers during the pandemic? Yes, there was bonus pay um, during the pandemic. I believe it was for the months of April through maybe June or July um, mm -hmm. for the staff. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, yeah. right now they have stopped the bonus payments um, for the staff, as um, CC pointed out earlier. But unfortunately, I just had a conversation today with the Wake County Health Consultant, and she said our clusters and our child care centers are actually at the highest that they have been since the pandemic. Uh, right now we have a center with 20 clusters in the center. So, um, you know, for them to take away the bonus payments, I'm not really sure the rationale um, from the legislators, um, you know, because this, the clusters are actually higher than they were when we shut down and all of that stuff um, back in the April timeframe last year. Yeah, I knew that it was insufficient, um, but that our state DCDE is trying its hardest to, to get funds prioritized to, to early educators. And we're certainly there in their ear <laughs> constantly. Um, thank you all for being with us today. Again, we'll send you the recording of this and all the materials. Um, and we look forward to hopefully hosting you again um, in, the, in the near future. So take good care and stay safe and dry if you're in the Carolinas or Southeast today. Thank you. Bye.